Yeah, by popular demand, we're ready to start back up. <laughs> we had longer than expected break. Uh, I'm going to go for two more lectures, but don't worry. They're like 20 slides a lecture. It's not that bad. But then we're going to have a lunch break, and then we're going to go for three or four more lectures. So we'll go up to about 3 o'clock-ish, 3.30-ish. Shh, I can't talk over everybody. Um, a couple of things of clarification from some comments that I had. We lost people at the break. We lost a couple. Oh, well. It's bound to happen. Um, I put up there, I had the TA put up on the top of the board there, tech support, T-E-C-H, support at itu.edu. If you don't have an EMS account, if you, and you don't know what the EMS is, and then I discovered some students don't know what EMS is. <laughs> if you're brand new, I made a false assumption, and I've been using the word EMS. EMS stands for Education Management System. It is a course content management thing. It's where you upload assignments, get assignments. Some of your instructors will have a separate website like I do. Some of them don't. Some of them just use the EMS. It depends on the teacher as to how it's going to be used. Everybody uses it for grading. Everybody uses it for assignment submissions. Uh, so what you'll end up having to do is upload your work to this EMS. Um, and some of you are supposed to get accounts automatically. If you're an existing student, you already have an account. You don't have to worry about it. And if you're a brand new student, you probably don't have access to it yet. Normally they run an orientation for new students, but they usually do it in the fall and the spring term. Summer's a little lightweight. Um, in fact, we had orientation last week, I think. Did you guys go to that? Did they talk yeah. about the EMS at all during the orientation? Yeah, they did, but uh, actually that time the system was down. Oh, perfect. <laughs> All right, so they tried. if you're having problems, you still don't have an EMS account, and you need access, go to the tech support at itu.edu. Don't bug me. Don't bug the TA because we don't have access to the system. We have no idea how in the world to even add a person to the system. All we can do is use the system like you can. Uh, the other thing, too, is don't panic because... Be, the way this course is structured, you can pack for your other classes, but the way this course is structured, you have a project that's due at the end of the course that has these deliverables. You can upload it all as one project at the end of the course if you want. So you don't want to wait until the end to start working on it. But you won't have to use the EMS for anything until at least past the second, second class meeting. Uh, the first thing you'll have to upload into it will be the results from your midterm exam. So you'll have to put that in, and there'll be a due date for it. But I don't even know what the due date is yet. So it'll be, you know, it'll be after the next, the next class meeting, which is going to be in what July or something. I don't have it in front of me. So, but if you do have any questions about the EMS, the tech support at itu.edu is your answer, your solution to that. Are there any other questions that people came up with? Anybody form a team? Yes. We yeah. Oh, great. <laughs> how many how many teams do we have now? Two. We are one team. Oh. oh, perfect, perfect. Mm -hmm. It was a productive use of your time. <laughs> Are you good? You guys gonna work by yourselves? Maximum five members. Huh? Maximum five members. Mm. Yeah. Is there a one who wants to be sixth member to something? Yeah, maximum five is really good. I mean, if you want to make an exception, I can approve by a case by bit case basis. But I, um, I don't. More than five is really hard to communicate. It's hard to break the work up, and then it's people just piggybacking on teams. So I mean, if you don't put, if I don't put a maximum on it, as I was mentioning, we'll have sixty people in one team. <laughs> it doesn't work out that well. So, all right, let's go into two and three, so we can have a break for lunch. Uh, what do we got here? Requirements, developing requirements. So. What we normally have is a domain analysis uh, analyst, excuse me, who uh, looks at the problem domain, and domain is just nothing more than another word to say that's the area that we're studying, to figure out or to understand what the requirements are. So here's the situation: a company, Acme Inc., builds software development, does software development, and a customer comes to company and says, "I need an accounting program built." Uh, do we have a full-time accountant on staff over at Acme Inc.? Probably not. So they might have to bring in someone who knows something about accounting. Uh, because what ends up happening is if you rely upon the customer to educate the software development team, they're going to think you don't know anything. So the software development team actually has to figure out 
well, let's learn accounting. You know, let's learn something so we know exactly what it is we have to put into the software program. So in terms of the analysis, the process by which the software engineer learns about the domain to better understand the problem. If you don't spend the time in the beginning to actually understand what you're building, you might as well just flip a coin on the features because you don't understand what an accounting program does. But not everyone who works at a software development company has accounting experience. So you get into this dilemma where you have the domain, and this is the definition for the domain is the general field of the business, the technology in which the client is going to use the software. The domain expert is the person with the deep knowledge of the domain. So sometimes going back to your CPT <laughs> and some of the internships, and if you're not a CPT person, then if you work in the U.S., it's called a consultant. You go to companies, you say, oh, you need an accounting expert. I'm an accounting expert. Okay, I'm not really one, but, you know, you go to a company, and they say, oh, what do you know about, and then they ask you a bunch of questions, and you're pretty much the domain expert. That's a nice job. You get to be a know-it-all. Well, the problem is you, not everybody has the same needs. So, again, it's one of those flexible part-time kind of things where you only spend a couple months at a company teaching them about accounting, and you spend a couple company, you go to another company and spend a couple more months teaching them about accounting or something. So we have this starting point that also has to be considered when looking at the project. We have new development or evolving or in addition to an existing system, we have A, B, C, and D. You're starting probably going to be in number A, unless you decide to do an upgrade. So if you have a brand new system that you've never built before, and your requirements must be determined during quadrant A, that's, that's one of the starting points. Or you might be in B, where the clients have produced the requirements for you. Nice. And then you go to B, but you don't have anything produced for you, hopefully. Is working with a brand new project. So you're in quadrant A, and, or if you're an existing company and there's an existing software package, maybe you wrote it, maybe somebody else wrote it, you might be in C, you know, if you're doing an upgrade, or you might end up in D. And depending upon where you start, obviously different projects start at different points, you know, they might end at different points, hopefully they're all ending at the same point, but the starting point actually does change a little bit. So we have some more flexibility in the starting point normally. Sometimes we do have flexibility in the end point. Sometimes your development company is only going to take it to a certain point. Somebody else is going to take that software and finish it. Somebody else is going to do something with it. So the starting point is usually something that has to be determined manually as well. And then determining the problem and the scope. This is where you get funny wording that happens in the requirements document. And before you leave today, we're going to go over the requirements document. So you know what your first deliverable is. Because for those of you who stayed after the first break, and I have to say this before the lunch break because I'm going to lose people at lunch. Your first deliverable, the requirements document, should be completed before the next class meeting. <laughs> if you don't have that done before the next class meeting, you're not going to be able to do the analysis and design that you're going to need to put together. Uh, you're going to be too far behind at that point. So that's going to be your homework between now and the next class meeting, is to put together that requirements document. Um, but I'll show you what to do before you leave. So the prom is going to be expressed in terms of a definition, and this is in the requirements document, we have Roman numeral one scope. Now, the first version of the XYZ you know, document is going to uh, cover this feature, this feature, and this feature. Because in the perfect world, you're, you know, would build everything, but sky's the limit. You know, but it's kind of like asking for a house to be built. You know? How many rooms is it going to have? How many bedrooms is it going to have? That's the scope. Or how many bathrooms? Is it? That's the scope. So difficulty. A problem can be expressed as a difficulty for the users to overcome. We're building this new EMS system because students want to know their grades immediately. They don't want to wait for something else. Um, or it can be an opportunity. And the solution to the problem normally will entail some sort of software development, hopefully. And that will apply towards your project as well. And in terms of defining the scope, the one on the left is big. The one on the right is narrowed. The more you narrow the scope, the more well-defined the problem is. So you can say you're building a university system. So on the left here we have the initial list of problems, a very broad scope where we have browsing courses, registering, room allocation, exam scheduling, and then over to the right we have a narrowing. We have one scope, two scope, three scope, four scope. The more you break the scopes out, the easier it is to actually understand what it is you're building. So you can determine the big picture and then determine the high level of goals and narrow them down. 
And it's okay to say, well, we're only going to build the registration module. Or we're only going to build a reporting module. Which is what companies do to kind of cost out their project. Because imagine if you have a registration system, are you going to charge just one price for the entire registration system? Or are you going to milk it <laughs> project after project? So version one of the registration system contains the browsing courses and the registry for $10,000. Version number two of the registration system also includes fee payment for $5,000. Version number three, and you just keep changing the scope. So you add features on it. You get three projects out of it for the, you know, better than the price of one. Or actually more money for the price of one. I'm like, oh yeah. I'll, it's like when you promise to do something for somebody. Oh yeah, I'll build that for you. And then you figure out what's involved in it. And you go, oh no. Why did I say I was going to do it for 500 bucks? <laughs> <laughs> you know? and, oh no, this is way too complicated. And then you go back and you renegotiate harder. And he's like, no, 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 you said you can do it for $500. Like, I'm going to you know, clean up my backyard for $500. Okay, no problem. Then you get back in the backyard to go clean it up. And you go, oh, I have to rent a dump truck for this. Oh, my God. I need to have contract a guy to cut this tree down, too. Oh, no. And you figure all these hidden expenses and you go, how can I agree to do this for $500? That's the problem if your scope is too broad. Instead, you go into the backyard and say, well, I clean up the brush, that's $500. Take down the tree, that's another $500. So that's how you wisely scope out your requirements so you can get um, maximize your payments and work effort. But it also, it's not necessarily for business purposes, although this is a business document. This is your license to work. This is your, your work request, your work order. So sometimes it's called a requirements document, sometimes it's called a statement of work. It depends on whether you're a single guy on Craigslist selling software development skills. And you've got a statement of work, usually something of that nature. And there's a contractor putting the other says, yeah, for $500, I'll write the XYZ module, and I'll give it to you in two days. Well, that's good. And hopefully you deliver it and you get paid. So. so in a lot of ways, the requirements is what you're going to get paid for. So it's a collection a requirements that goes into the requirements document, nothing else goes in there outside of requirements. So we have functional and we have non-functional. This stuff's actually kind of easy because you guys, most of you guys have software backgrounds. Anyone not have a software background? No one's going to raise their hand. How many people have software backgrounds? Uh, easier question. Except for my T and the guy in the corner. <laughs> That's okay. You can get more information from my weekday class too. <laughs> so. Functional, I'm like, okay, well, for those people without a software background, it's like two seconds to go. Function is critical, otherwise the system's not going to work. Non-function is mutually cosmetic. It's a constraint, and that's the example I like to use is, must have a password field, that be a functional or a non-functional requirement. If the application needed a password field, functional, right? That's you can all see that? If we wanted the password field encrypted, it might be functional. It might be non-functional. This would be functional. There's a gray line between, depending upon the reason why it needed to be encryption, encrypted, might be a security requirement that might be functional. We want the password field to show up in blue. <laughs> non-functional. If the system would operate without the feature, just fine, or if we had choices with the feature, it could be blue, it could be red, it could be orange, non-functional. If it has something to do with the critical functionality of the system or a key component, functional. So that's why I just use the word cosmetic. A lot of non-functional requirements are like cosmetic in nature. Let's have the company logo. Could you replace that with any other logo? Yeah. <laughs> Having the logo would be functional. Having the company's logo would be non-functional at a certain point. So what ends up happening is the biggest problem with this requirements document is figuring out what's functional, what's non-functional. So a lot of people skip it completely and don't use the categories. Instead, they break it out by the system functionality, and they go, user interface, ah, database design, ah, you know, and they have all the features listed out instead. So. You can think of the requirements document as features, 
you can think of it as functional and non-functional in terms of those categories. And when I get done with this lecture, I'm going to show you. The, we'll go back to page 25 and take a look at the template again. And we'll talk about what you need to do. But what we're looking at is listing out everything that needs to go into the system in terms of what it has to contain. How you organize it is completely up to you. And so you have some software development teams that like to go functional, non-functional. You have some that likes to go category by category by category. And if you think about it logically, it depends on how the team operates. As a classic example, they always wait till the last minute. If you were uh, taking a student taking a course, you actually have functional and non-functional assignments because you have some assignments that are worth more points than other assignments. So if you had a choice, you'd probably pick the high assignments, high point assignments to complete first, making sure you absolutely had those got done for your grade, and then you can skip a little five-point thing or something, right? You know, especially if you don't think you have enough time for it. Companies do the same thing. <laughs> they are just lots of students working together. They're waiting for the last minute. Well, they're not really purposely doing it. That's what ends up happening. And at one point, they got to stop and deliver something. If they made sure they got all their functional requirements in there, they could skip half the non-functional ones, which is what the thinking is. So. Yeah, if the program works, so oh, you want your company logo. Oh, we don't have it yet. You won't put your company logo in. And then they can twiddle with the rest of it until they're done with the non-functional, meaning they got a majority of what was asked for in there. If the requirement spec is that outlined functional, non-functional, then the design spec can be outlined because we have this thing called traceability that occurs. So everything that's in the requirements document as a what feature is described in the design document. So section three here is section three down here, or the numbering kind of goes trace, trace between the different versions of the documents so we can figure out where that feature is actually implemented and where this feature is implemented, where that feature is implemented. If we organize the document by functional, non-functional, we could focus on the functional, leave the non-functional for last, and work with that strategy. Only problem is, is what does the customer usually notice? The non-functional. <laughs> so it's counterintuitive. They judge the entire program on the user interface. And I wanted the logo and the logo's not there. I don't care how much computer processing is going on and how well the database is structured, but the logo is missing. Oh my god. You know, the color's the wrong color. All of a sudden, the whole program gets judged on non-functional quality factors. That's where a lot of companies have kind of abandoned the non-functional, functional thinking and said, all right, just put it out and we'll focus on the user interface because that's really important to the customer. Or the real customer is really important and really concerned about the transcript request module. And you can put priorities if you wanted to on the features and more you know, feature by feature basis instead of functional by functional. So that's why we have this distinction that occurs. And that's where it came from. And it's all about the structure. So inside of the requirements document, we have the inputs, the outputs, the data that's being stored, the computation, the timing. It's the list that you've been looking at for the last few minutes. It's all about what's in, in terms of the content of this particular document. And that would be considered the functional list. The non-functional comes into play, and here's, here's the other problem too. There's no steadfast rule that says something is functional and something is non-functional. As I mentioned, an example of the password encryption, it might be considered functional to some, non-functional to others. And here's another couple, couple of my main categories here going on with non-functional. Some of these I put into functional. If you're building a heart monitor, that thing would have to be reliable. I wouldn't call that a non-functional requirement. I'd call that a functional requirement. It must be 99.9% .9 accurate, reliable, dependable. I uh, must have good throughput response time. <laughs> But let's say it's not a heart monitor, let's say it's a, a word processor. People sit there and wait for the document to save. Oh, well, you'll wait. But if it's controlling a regulation or something, you're not going around. It'll have to happen now, or it might not happen five minutes from now. So it depends on the type of application as to sometimes what some category fits into, which also causes confusion. So it's important to know about functional and non functional. It's not important to use it in the requirements stock in terms of its format. And I'm going to allow you to read through this, which is how I'm going to get through this slide set. 
non-boring fashion. There's a lot of re there's a lot of reading on the slides. This is lecture number two. <laughs> Feel free to download it and read through all the important details of every single example that you might want to run into. Uh, the first category being a reflecting categories of usability effectiveness. Yeah. Yeah, you could classify in terms of business requirements. I put them in a functional versus a non-functional. I'm talking about school risks. Yeah, everything goes in the requirements actually. And yeah, when we look, business no, um, software engineers don't normally put together business requirements. Uh, that's left for the executives, managers, non-software developer people. Yeah, business analysts will do that, yeah. They'll put together risk assessment plans, they'll put together business tasks, feasibility, process re-engineering, BPR, continuous process improvement, improvement, quality assurance stuff. Will all be done by business people. And in fact, you know, sometimes it's done globally, like one guy will work on everything for all the projects. And um, well, this particular requirement spec is project by project usually done by the project. Actually, it doesn't have to be done by the developers. And that's going back to that little quadrant thing I showed you in the beginning. Sometimes the users will give you a requirement stock. <laughs> Sometimes they'll bring in a domain expert. They'll have everything spec'd out. They'll have it for years. It's kind of like how you go and you take your car into the mechanic and it gives you a quote. And then you take the car home and you say, well, it's my convertible top and it's broken. Well, I can still drive the car without it. It's $1,200. I'm gonna wait till it's the middle of winter. I'm not gonna open up the top till summer, right? So I'm gonna wait till June, save up the money, and bring my car in. So you come in and hey, here's my quote. But maybe you don't go to the same mechanic. You go to another one or something because the first mechanic's out of business because nobody went to him because his prices were too high. So you take a little white out, you cover the price up, <laughs> you take the quote in. See, this is what I need. See, I need a the, the, the blah, 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 and I need the blah, 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 and I need this cleaned out. And here, give me a price. How much will you charge? And he says, oh, how about $800? And you go, yeah, I've scored. And then you take the car and you have it fixed. But it's already scoped out, and it's already, the requirements documents already put together, required to have this replaced, this replaced, this replaced. But he, um, mechanic number two, is able to give you refurbished parts or something. Mechanic number one is selling your brand new right from the factory. So sometimes those requirements come in many different directions. That's my point I was trying to make. And sometimes they're not built by the team. So. Uh, in fact, going back to my auto mechanic, <laughs> for you guys who are new to the US, never believe an auto mechanic <laughs> when you buy your first used car here and there's a noise, take it to a cochlea. It's actually the same thing with the medical fields out here. Never believe one doctor. Take it and get multiple quotes, multiple requirements specs done because one guy might sell you everything and the other guy might say, oh, you don't need that, you don't need that. And that is the problem you have. This is what you need. So you get varying different opinions, unfortunately. I'm, I don't know if that's the same in every country, but in the U.S. it seems to be a buyer beware kind of economy. In India there's more than that. Oh, really? So we're good? On the yeah, comparison, better. this yeah, is more honest. That's right. And actually, if you're female and you bring a car in, it's worse. <laughs> because they look at you and go, oh, sucker, got it, got it, $2,000. What? And then you bring your brother in or your husband in, and they go, oh, $500. <laughs> and then I put that as a global model. <laughs> oh, that's a global model. <laughs> that's always cheaper. Yeah. Or it works in the reverse, too. If you go into a bakery or you go into a restaurant, the guy's going to pay more than the girl. <laughs> Woman's yeah. going to get a cheaper price on a restaurant. Oh, yeah. Catering jobs, much cheaper than if a guy comes in. <laughs> Depends on the industry. Yeah. All right, going back to this stuff so I can finish this. Uh, categories. I'm looking at the first category is usability, uh, re, you know, re reliability, efficiency. The second category might be environment, maybe technology. Third might be something about project plan, development methods. These are all different categories of requirements. So you might be able to put in the requirements document that you must follow the waterfall model. Or maybe it'll say, you know, have to use a rapid application development cycle or something. And 
So in, right, in the requirements document, you can actually have categories that are non-traditional. You can have ones that are traditional, ones that are about the development process, about the technology. And as we'll see in the example I'm going to bring up, when I get down with this slide set, there's stuff in there about, in fact, she mentioned it earlier, about Microsoft Visual C++. That might not necessarily be in your requirements doc. It's just one category that appeared in this other one because that's an upgrade. And the whole program was written in C++, so it has to, you know, obviously, then they don't want you to rewrite it in Java or something. Uh, Non-functional requirements, product requirements in terms of performance must uh, must be fast, must work on a particular operating system, maybe some organizational requirements, must provide training. They're selling a people soft solution. The requirement spec is going to have more training in there than anything else, or maybe some consulting time, where you have to stick around once you install it for at least two weeks. Not as much as SAP, but uh, PeopleSoft is pretty difficult for users to actually use once it's installed. Uh, maybe some external requirements, legal interoperability. Uh, you're building a software for an ATM machine. It has to be able to connect to the service network or whatever, the star network. Something about interconnecting. Maybe for privacy. In fact, here we have privacy categories and uh, broken out into functional and non-functional. You can do this if you want in your requirement stack. Or you can stick by category by category and make up your categories. Um, in terms of privacy, the functional requirement, the usage data for the management system must be uh, obtained. Non-functional must I, not identify individuals. It's like a uh, in functional requirement, ATM must print a receipt. Non-functional, you can't put the whole card number on the receipt. In fact, in the old days, they used to do that. <laughs> you know, you find an ATM, slip on the ground, pick it up, oh, here's the account number. <laughs> now you see it's all asterisks on there. I don't know why, I don't know how in the world they did that for years. Receipts used to do that from stores and stuff. Nobody ever really thought it was a security issue, a privacy issue. Now, actually, I'm glad to see that they're hiding information on the internet, too. So now most of the programs you sign up for will show your username. It doesn't have to be your name, so you can put a different name on there. Uh, minimizing records, retain all the required records, discard all the other records perhaps that should not be part of the transaction. Actually nowadays we have legal registration, uh, excuse me, legal um, compliance to certain rules, data protection, security acts that passed the year 2000 where you can't store all the digits of the social security number. You can't store more than two pieces of information on an individual. You can't store credit card numbers. You can't store addresses past the time that they're going to be used. And all of these rules, it's like, you know, two inches thick. <laughs> you could put that in your requirements document, <laughs> but you're not going to probably. You're going to probably make reference. So the requirements document can have references. Like, see the Abide by the Data Protection Act of the year 2000. See article blah 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 of the U.S. blah blah blah. So you might have references as well. Um, especially if, let's say, you're building something that works with TCP/IP, or you know, put the entire TCP/IP documentation from the IEEE or something. Actually, not from the IEEE, but you're going to put that in there. No, <laughs> you're going to say, you know, see the appendix, or not even that at all. Just see, you know, refer, refer to something. So some, te some techniques for gathering the requirements and analyzing them. Um, in the real world, you're not going to use these for your project, but in your real world, in fact, this is, happens all the time. In fact, if I were building an EMS for ITU, you could observe what people are doing. You could listen to all of the complaints. You could read the log files. You could watch people using the system, um, which are some of the examples. You could read the documents and discuss the requirements with the users. You can involve the users, you can interview the users. Interesting phenomenon is this kind of like a double-edged sword. The more you involve the user, the harder it is to actually finish the system. Because we end it with, and this is, and I don't like this, and I don't like that, turns into a rant. It turns into people complaining, and it turns into a big mm. disaster. In fact, it's a complete waste of time to some people. Unfortunately, it's a requirement that has to be done because if you don't involve the users, they show up Monday morning. It happens it usually happens a lot in big companies. Show up Monday morning, you turn your computer on. What's this? 
I don't like this. Where's the old system? They don't like it. And then you figure out, oh, we didn't put this feature in there that Susie uses every day. Now Susie can't do that anymore. You know, so, okay, well, we didn't know Susie did that. So unfortunately, you have to involve the users in order to get a really good set of requirements. But unfortunately, you have to do it in moderation. <laughs> because it could be a complete waste of time. Or you could not involve the users at all or involve a slight subsection of those users and put them in with a bunch of expert people <coughs> and do a brainstorming technique. And that's very popular, Jad sessions. Kit Network came out a couple, I don't know, maybe 10 or 15 years ago. People said, oh yeah, joint application development as a buzzword and everyone was doing Jad. But you know what, people do it anyway, naturally. You're building an air temperature controller software unit, your Acme Inc building software to put it on an air temperature controller. Do you really have any full-time staff people that know anything about temperatures, control units, or any of the technology that you're building the software for? Probably not. So what you're going to do is you're going to bring in a couple of consultants, maybe some CEOs of some companies. What you do is you fly them in, you put them up in a nice hotel, you give them a couple good dinners, <laughs> you take them to a Sharks game, and then Oh yeah, um, part of the agreement was you have to sit in for a couple of hours where we talk about the requirements and tell us whether or not we're on track. And they sit there and they listen and they go, ah, oh, yeah, that sounds absurd. Why are you doing it this way? You should be doing it that way. And that little bit of information that you paid for uh, by entertaining this guy for a weekend or something is valuable. So that's how most of the jab sessions are going on. In fact, there's high paid CEOs who actually just do nothing but travel around look at stuff and go, I hate it. <laughs> I like it. Or, eh, it's not going to, you're not going to sell that product. <laughs> uh, but it's nice because then at least you know the reality of the situation and that's what jazz people do. They build, and build experts and stuff. In fact, it's kind of like what you can do for a lot of different things like accreditation and stuff that you're bringing. And we had, actually we had a mock site visit before our last visit and we had Take people come in and actually kind of mock the, the whole thing and gave us a report back and said, ah, you're strong at this, you're weak at that. <laughs> so when the real guys come in, you need to fix this, you need to do this, you know, kind of make sure we were on track, which is money well spent, actually. All they do is fly these guys in, put them in a nice hotel, give them a couple good dinners, <laughs> train them to a Sharks game, and they're done. And they get the information they need. That's a practice in the U.S. that's probably done elsewhere, but in elsewhere they, they call it bribery. Right? <laughs> we don't have bribery in the U.S. That doesn't exist. But we have sharks tickets, free weekends in the Bahamas, <laughs> Hawaii, popular golf. Golf is good. I get bribed with golf all the time. Hey, can you fix my? Oh yeah, while you're here, we're gonna play 18 rounds. Of, oh, but before on the way to the course, we're gonna slip by the office. I'm take a look at my network. Oh, I am? Yeah. <laughs> All right. I'll take a look. <laughs> or I get students who send me assignments. Hey, can you take a look at this? They know mm -hmm. if I look at it first, but then you get you don't have to bribe me though. This is America. <laughs> no bribery. <laughs> That's just a free service. All right. Although, if I recognize who you are, I'm most likely able to fight for you in any type of situation when you have a dispute with the administration or something. Amen. It's a frightening. <laughs> Gathering and analyzing, going back, prototyping. All right, I'm going to actually talk about prototyping in the next interactive session. However, it can be used, and this is the point the slide's trying to make, to elicit requirements. So you could show a prototype to somebody, especially if it's a brand new system they've never used before. I say, hey, you're a brand new student at ITU. Here's an EMS prototype. Can you use it? Can you figure out, maybe they should have done this. <laughs> Can you figure out how to log in? Can you figure out how to post an assignment? Can you figure out, and then you use the prototyping as an educational experience to generate a list of requirements, either for the user interface, which is used a lot for to test the interface, or it could be used for features, um, or you could actually use it to make sure you've understood the requirements correctly. Because here's what happens in a lot of outsourcing situations. The guy on the other end speaks multiple languages. You speak one language. I don't know. You can only communicate back and forth through email. You know how bad email is? You know, Even text messaging is really bad. You said, what? I'm really offended now, you know, off of some miscommunication that goes on. So the 
you bring in the jazz people, yay, I'm an expert on this, expert on that, and they all say a bunch of stuff. How do you know you heard everything that everyone actually said? And put the pieces together right. If you can build a prototype, you can have proof of concept. Like, oh, okay, and then you show it to the people and say, is this what you're talking about? Oh, yeah, that's where the foot control goes, and that's where the eye written scan goes, and okay, yeah, that's how it all works. Or they can come back and say, what is this? This is not what we asked for. Oh, what it sounds like. I uh, use interface mockups written in rapid application programming languages. A lot of Visual Basic is actually used for this these days, especially if it's a Windows application. Something where you can actually mimic the real interface. Um, it's just a prototype, though. Simple, paper-based, maybe computerized. Uh, we also have informal use case analysis, which brings up UML, and I'll talk a lot about that in the next next weekend. Uh, class session. Determining the classes of the users, facilities, the actors, determining the tasks that are going to be for being performed. A lot, much, lot more of this later on in the course, but this is more design philosophy. But if you know UML, you know use case scenarios. And uh, use case scenarios are used in testing, they're used in requirement solicitation, they're used in the design documentation, and they're reusable. So you could take the same use case scenarios and go through the entire development process with it. If you're not familiar with the concept of a use case scenario, it's person inserts card in ATM. <laughs> ATM comes back and says, what's your PIN? User enters in the PIN. It's basically scenarios about how the user is interacting with the system. So you can come up with a list of these and say, did we get all the requirements? No, because the, there's a password and a PIN. You only ask for the password. Oh, okay, so then you can fix logic. So we have two different types of extremes. I've talked about this already, actually. There's a difference between the definition and the specification. The definition being the high-level usage, simple uh, descriptions, and the specification being the uh, long list of specifications and thousands of pages of intricate details about how the machine asks for the user password, <laughs> or how something's actually being done. Levels of detail required for the requirements document. And because the first problem you're going to run into after you go over the obstacle of figuring out a project you're going to build, any team do this yet? I know you guys pick teams. Nobody knows what you're going to build yet. Yeah, that's a little bit more complicated. <laughs> so then when you start building the requirements document, when are we done? How many requirements? Do? And most days we'll come back, how many pages does this have to be? And we go, I don't know. Page. There's no minimum or no maximum. It's rare that you can actually build a system in two years with a requirements doc that's less than a page. <laughs> Very infrequent when you see something of that size. However, two pages depends on how brief, how descriptive you are. You could do a nice one in two pages. Usually, real life ones are 20 to 30 pages, actually. Uh, they could get pretty lengthy. So what makes them lengthy? It depends on the size of the system, the need to interface with the system, readership. Obviously, the longer it is, it's keep it short and simple. The KISS method, you guys remember that? Not business people. You got, have you heard of that? K-I-S-S? Some place there's That's not an international thing. Kissing is international, but the KISS method, K-I-S-S, keep it short and simple. Well, in business school, they teach you this, right? MBA school, you have an MBA people. MBA people learn kiss. They learn how to kiss an MBA. <laughs> kiss butts. They kiss, <laughs> kiss everything. <laughs> They're business people. They have to. <laughs> Software engineers can get away with a lot more. <laughs> K stands for keep. I stands for it. Short and simple. About 20 years ago, this was real popular. It's kind of like, you know, LOL. Up <laughs> today. You guys know what that means, right? Laugh out loud. RF rolling on the floor laughing, and BTW, and BFFs, and all that text slang that we talk about. About 20 years ago, we go, the KISS method. <laughs> well, let's keep it short and simple. Meant, you know, don't bog me down with a bunch of detail. Just tell me the facts. Just tell me. You know, I keep it short and simple, and it's easier to communicate. You know, let's say. Anyway, that was a buzzword for business people a long time ago. So. Uh, the stage in the requirements gathering also determines how much level of detail, the level of experience of the domain, actually the level of experience of the software engineers. The more experienced they are, believe it or not, the shorter the document gets. 
Inexperienced people will put everything in the kitchen sink in there and will overspec it because they want to make sure they don't miss anything. Experienced people go, ah, oh, we already did this before, we're not going to miss it. Reviewing the requirements, uh, each individual requirement should have a benefit that outweighs the cost of the development. This is where it gets tricky and you don't really have to do this for your projects. However, in the real world, it's not in there unless there's a reason for it to be in there. It's got to outweigh the benefit. If the benefit's got to act, act, outweigh the reason why you put it in there. It has to be important for the solution. It has to be insignificant. It has to be clear, concise, unambiguous, logically consistent, sufficient quality, verifiable, identifiable, all these different qualities. And it does not over constrain the design of the system. So the biggest problem I see with software engineering students is they put, must be built in Visual C++ version 4.0. And this is the year 2011. 4.0 is kind of old. I don't know what we're up to now. In fact, we don't even have it. We have Visual Studio now, .NET version 10, 2010 or something. I don't know what's current. That's impossible to build. So on that one requirement alone, you can't build the system. It's done. So what you want to do is build the requirements that's going to outlive time, the current year. So it must be built for a Windows platform. Don't say .NET, and unless it actually has to work with a .NET system. And you're going to see an example in a few minutes that's going to be very specific, but it's an upgrade. <laughs> if you're working on an upgrade, you actually have to put that into the requirements doc. Because you can't build an upgrade for a system that doesn't work on .NET. I built it in Java. Okay, great. We're installing it on a .NET system. <laughs> it has to work on the right platform. It has to be written in the right language. And here's where that word traceability comes into play, where we have the rationale that goes on between here's what we asked for, what we wanted in the requirements, here's how we implemented it in the design, and we have a one-to-one -one traceability here that goes between the two documents, where each feature in the design is also listed in the requirements. That way we know what we're building. So sufficiently complete, well-organized, clear, and agreed to by all stakeholders. If it is, then we're building it to spec. We're building it to the specification. Which means we're following our specs, which is our requirements document. That means there's no features in the design document that don't exist in the requirements document. That's kind of a no-brainer, no? <laughs> Happens all the time. Like, where'd this feature come from? And some overzealous programmer went, ah, no, it'd be nice to have a little, you know, administrative screen, right? Here, I put one in. They didn't ask for it. Just because you put it in and then they want it. Maybe it's a security leak or something, or maybe there's a problem. Maybe they specifically did not want it for some reason. So let's take a look at the document itself, and I'll show you the real template in a few minutes. We're going to outline the problem. We're going to have some background information. Very brief. It's not, a, it's not a document like an essay. It's not a report. Each requirement is on a separate line, and it's a complete sentence. It's the only thing about the document format that follows an English standard. Outside of that, it's a free flow kind of requirement specification where it was functional and non-functional requirements and not necessarily in that order. So what we have are looking at changing requirements that occur. So if we lay it out, then we can organize it, we can change it, we can modify it, we can analyze it. It becomes a useful starting point for the project. The requirements is the starting point. So in terms of managing the changing requirements, we have concepts like scope creep. Have you guys heard of that one? Where usually you end up putting a consultant in to get rid of the scope creep. <laughs> because they're not familiar with the system to the point where they're overly anxious about adding new features onto it. And the customer, they don't interface with the customer, and the customer ends up causing the scope creep problem. And the end users do it. Because they keep adding and adding and adding and adding features to it to the point where the scope is creeped so much that the program will never finish. You'll never actually complete this thing. So requirements change a lot from the beginning of the software project to the end. <clears throat> they change because the business process of technology changes. Or maybe the problem becomes more understandable. So the customer approaches XYZ company. So you say, I had no idea how to do a temperature control program. They've been working on it for six months. All of a sudden, they know how to do it. <laughs> they go, wait a minute, this is different. 
than I originally imagined it. Uh-oh. You don't start over normally, but the requirements are set in stone because you follow the waterfall model, you end up with a problem. This is the changing requirements that ends up happening. And uh, the analysis may never stop. So requirements analysis continues. Uh, as you continue to react with the client, with the server, with, with, with the uh, users, benefits might change, might outweigh costs. You end up with a problem. All of a sudden, you understand the problem better. Here's where the negotiation comes into play. So the customer comes to you, and they gave you a requirement stock. You didn't develop it, let's say, this scenario. You start working on it. Then you've got leverage. Then you can come back and say, well, your requirement said you needed this, this, and this. However, we've discovered you'll get 50% more efficiency if you put in an Oracle database. Oh. But we're changing the requirements. So it's going to take us two extra weeks to do this, and it's going to cost us $10,000 more. <laughs> so you may want to pay the money and give us some two extra weeks. We'll implement it for you. Where you get leverage. That doesn't always happen, though, because what ends up happening is the team will develop the requirements. So you started in quadrant number A instead, and you got the requirements, and you got them from the users. And then it's your mistake, and you end up eating the costs. So that's where a lot of the problems with software engineering occur. You can't go back and say, we've discovered <laughs> that we really should have put in a database, and we didn't, and we didn't expect this out. And the software license is going to cost us $10,000 to put this in. Um, you know, oh, you eat the cost. <laughs> now it's your problem. So that's where the requirements is actually ends up being the most important starting point because it's going to determine how much money you're going to make, how much time you're going to be allotted. It's going to determine everything about the project. And the catch-22 to it is you don't know if your requirements are good until after you've started the project. So that's where you get these le these long, lengthy legal contracts that say, if this happens, if that happens, if this happens, and then you spend too much time negotiating, and all of a sudden, oh, let's just split it. You pay us five thousand, we'll pay five thousand, and we'll put the database in. So difficulties and risk in the domain and the requirements analysis. Here's just a small list. In fact, I didn't read you all those managing changes list either. You can download the slice set and read it more slowly. Lack of the understanding requirements might change. Like you're developing a product that's not going to be released for two years. Meanwhile, the world's changing. <laughs> two years ago, the requirements would have been different than they are today, and they are going to be from two years from now. But the project's taking you two years. So it's not happening overnight. That's why people go wrap it up in development because requirements change too quickly and market changes too quickly. Uh, but that's one of the problems you're going to run into uh, using a regular development cycle. And uh, it might be hard to reconcile conflicting sets of requirements that might come out of JAD sessions and user requirements and things. And so here's where these documents fit into the life cycle. We're assuming we've done a feasibility study and now we're looking at requirements analysis. We could put together some system models, which would be early prototyping. Models. You're not going to have to do that. The prototype that you're going to put together is you're going to do it after the design is created. And I'll talk about prototyping in the next next weekend section. But what we're looking at right now is coming up with this guy right here, the requirements document. After you've done your feasibility, theoretically, after you analyze the problems, you're going to be thinking about your requirements. You're going to put together this requirements document here, which is going to be your definitions of what you're defining, what your system's going to do. And then the next stage is that you would actually put it into a specification. You don't have to do that. You just stop at the design, at the definition, excuse me. Um, so you're not really taking it to the second step. But if this were a real development project, after you've defined it, then you spec it out. Because it's kind of like doing a rough draft and then a final copy. Because the spec's got more information in it. So it's kind of like decomposition. You're taking the big problem, breaking it up, and then breaking it up again. Make it smaller, smaller. So the smaller you go, you just start getting its specification instead of definition. Actually. What's the purpose of the requirements specification? It describes the requirements to the stakeholders. It's your contract with the customer and the group. It also has another audience. It describes the requirements to the implementers. 
to the outsource company, to the developers. And it records the requirements for the future. So you can build another project for down the road and not have to start over again from scratch. You say, well, this other system that we built for this other accounting system that we built for ABC company is very similar to the accounting system we need to build for XYZ company. Hmm. Let's go back and look at the requirements. They had this screen, that screen, and you asked the customer, well, do you want this screen and that screen? And it would be unethical to actually sell them the same program. But it's not unethical to reuse design patterns and philosophies and things. So, and what ends up happening is people take an unethical approach to that. They make one generic system and then they resell it with feature modifications to multiple different companies and they market it as, oh, this is your system. <laughs> it's brand new. And uh, combine that with a little outsourcing effort, uh, one of the biggest problems. And if you sold me the same system that you sold that guy, like you think you're buying a Unix system, but you're not. It's like the same, the same algorithm, same system. Under a different name. Which some people think is unethical, some people think it's smart. And yeah, some people say you see you in court. Maybe a contractual document as well. Alright, so let's take a look at this sucker, then we'll go to lunch. How's that? So it's already twelve thirty, so I guess I'll cover lecture three after. Uh, where am I? There it is. Page number 25 of the course notes. I have to cover this before lunch because I'm not going to see some of you guys after lunch. There should be like a go-to thing, isn't there? Like a... Uh, I'll just use the page down. I right, know, let's just scroll faster this way. Yep, there it is. All right, page 25 of the course notes. Here's your first deliverable. So I didn't really give you that much to do, actually, because between now and when is the next class meeting? June 11th. 18th. 18th? 18th. It's less than a month away. <laughs> between now and this class seems too short. Between now and next month, then you should put this document together for your team. So you, you got to organize your team. You got to pick your topic out, and you got to put this document together. Because when we come back the next time, we're going to take it from this point forward. We're going to take and do the analysis and the design, which is actually the same thing. The analysis document is your rough draft for the design. The design takes you two seconds. Analysis is going to, is going to take you until the next intro. I mean, going to, those two activities we're going to do together, and I'll explain prototyping as well. It seems like a lot, but given the number of activities, this is the most time consuming. <laughs> Once you get past this, the rest of it's easy. The rest of it comes rather easily for you. Uh, and this is only worth five points. The rest of it's worth a lot more points, which is kind of ironic. The most work is into the fewest number of points. <laughs> but it's designed that way because in the beginning, teams have problems. People can't find team members. The first deliverable is always botched up. And because it's the hardest, it should have like the fewest number of points, right? <laughs> so you can. Do a really lousy job, lose your four or five points, but do well on the rest of it and you're home free. So that's the philosophy. All right, so here, what are you putting together? <coughs> you're going to use this type of numbering system. This is the reason why I'm showing you this template and going over it is because this is a source of confusion for everybody who's not sitting here today. They look at this thing and they go, oh, I have to have those categories and this is how I need to write it, uh, but my program's not going to fit in that right. Uh, so let me tell you what you're supposed to do. You want to use line numbers. You have section 1, section 2, section 3. This is what I'm talking about here. We have 1, 2, 3. However, these categories might not be your categories. As I mentioned before, you could break it out functional, non-functional. You could break it out feature, 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 feature. You're always going to want to start out at the beginning with the scope. So what we've got is section one in the name of section one, scope. <laughs> section two is named reference documents. Section three is general. Because this is an upgrade. So if we read the scope, we know exactly what it is. This is it. The software requirements definition or document, the SRD, 
covers. Uh, those requirements pertaining to the interface, internal operation, and reporting functions of the S XYZ company or program. So XYZ program already exists. And this requirements document is for the interface, external operation, and reporting functions that maybe didn't, weren't included in the first version. And then uh, the identification. You may or may not necessarily have an identification section. Or you could just put this in as a template. This is actually kind of deceiving because it says 1.0, which is kind of a typo, actually. I probably should change that and put like 5.0 or something on there. The document covers version 1.0 of the XYZ program. At this time, a formal name has not been identified for the program module. If you have a code name, this document covers 1.0 of the um, teamwork. Over there. <laughs> the teamwork program or something. Then you can kind of keep an internal tracking. So section one is just the scope, what the document's all about, how you're going to identify it, because each one of these documents is standalone, self-containing. So you pick up a requirements document, and if it's for a regular software development company, it's all going to be formatted the same way. In the real world, this format comes from your accreditation body. It comes from your standardization and your compliance organization. If you're building a product that has to be IEEE certified, you're going to use the IEEE certified requirements document format. That's what these standardizing companies do. The ISO has a format, the DOD. This is a combination, it's a hybrid of the DOD and the IEEE, actually. This is, and it's old. It's based upon like the second revision of the DOD standard that they released back in the 70s. <laughs> it's really old. But the problem is, it's kind of like programming languages. The old days, things were simpler. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, everything gets added to it. Oh my god, these formats now, you have to have an expert. You have to hire a consultant to come in and be your IEEE certified document specialist. Because if you don't put the document in the right format, it doesn't get scanned incorrectly, and you don't get your contracts, and you don't get cert, and you lose your certification, and you're not in compliance. It's kind of like what education universities have to do for, for WASC for accreditation. You have to have this in a certain order, that in a certain order. This is a certain format that has to be a certain way. Otherwise, you don't get a credit. <laughs> so, some of you guys who are stuck around for this process have been watching it going on. We're trying to get our ducks in order so we can get our candidacy status, which may actually happen next month. Who knows? No word yet, unless you guys have heard something. I haven't heard anything from them. We guys here for the last visit? I know you guys were students. Yeah, um, the, um, we had a word with the uh, administration team as well, so they were telling us that it huh? be done in a month, but... Uh, I mean, June is what I heard. Maybe I got the wrong information. Oh, May is what you told me? Yeah, I mean, they were saying that it'll be done by the, it'll be done in a month. Or by oh, really? Time, I mean, it's, I mean it's, it's still pending. Have you heard anything? Sorry? Have you heard anything? No. Okay. No. I guess you wouldn't know much about it anyway. <laughs> I don't know. Not it's official. Yeah. I, I thought that, I thought it went well. It went well. But yeah, mostly people are saying it'll be done by June or I mean. I heard June. I think a month was overly optimistic. Because they had some questions and they had, we had to give them information that they didn't have yet, so to put this stuff together. So they were still missing some of the paperwork they knew. Anyway, long story short, that's the, uh, that's what determines the format, determines the style. Um, so this one particularly is just made up. It's hypothetical, so don't use this in the real world. Actually, you know the thing is, you see worse than this okay, because people don't who who abides by. You decide you're going to write an app for an iPhone. <laughs> Are you going to go out and get yourself credited? Are you going to go out and going to get yourself certified by the IEEE or that? No. Usually, there's no crediting. There's no governing body for the particular industry, for the particular development. You can get yourself Microsoft certified, but they don't do with development. They just do with something else. So, I mean, development efforts. But long story short, you got to make it up. If you're Acme Inc., you don't have anything. You make it up. Just like you make up your software development lifecycle model. And then once you make it up, you find out what works and you make it best practice. And then you follow the best practice. So every requirements document that this company produces is always in the same format. This is always in the same format. It's kind of like forms, add drop forms, and registration forms. Always going to be in the same. Every year you register, it's going to be in the same format, hopefully. So. 
All right, so going back to the document here, we have a system over overview. We usually have something like that. So, so it's designed to provide the DAP personnel, managers, developers, whatever, with the records. So this particular case where our interest is not understanding what this document's doing, what this program is doing, but to analyze the format. You want to put the description of it in there because it may not be self-explanatory. However, you notice it's pretty short. This whole thing is like two pages long. Yours can be that length. You don't have to create one that's 20 pages long. It can be this short. However, this is nicely scoped. And this is adding three little features to a program. So it's pretty small. Uh, but we need that system overview. And the interesting thing is once you write it once for your requirement stock, you can reuse. In fact, this entire section on the top, scope, identification, all the way through section one is usually repeated on each document. So you'll take this and you'll put it in your analysis and you'll also put it in your design document. Because you can pick up the design document and go without looking at the requirement stock. Because <laughs> you want to make it short and simple. You want to make it so that each one of them is standalone. But you can totally reuse between the documents. It's not like plagiarism or anything. It's actually considered great. Because you start reading it and you refresh memory. Oh yeah, this is the XYZ program. Okay. You can slowly come up to speed on that. Section two, you may or may not have any reference documentations. And here we have none at this time. It's in here, which says, if you think later on you might have it, put a placeholder in. Say, we're going to have some reference documents. If we're building this particular program, may have actually had some reference documents. Um, because they may have had something that they were working with already. You see? The requirement spec for the first version of this program. That would be a reference document. So you can actually do that or you could put it in the appendix or something. So you're, it's like writing a paper, but you're not writing a paper. One thing to notice that I forgot to mention so far, these are all complete sentences. You don't have one word sentences. Sentences normally contain more than one word. They're fully legal English sentences, although you're not going to be graded on your English language skills. Uh, then we have this one 3.0 section, or 3.1, well, it's actually section 3. You could have put 3.0 if you wanted. You could have also indented. The bullets are really a bad, bad example. If you number everything, that's great. Otherwise, if you just want to say 3.1 is a general and bullet everything underneath it, see these bullets here? That's fine as well. It's better print probably to number everything. I can keep. It's like an outline. It's a full sentence outline is what this is. And here we have a full sentence. The program shall be developed as a 32-bit Windows application using Visual C++ version 6.0. That's a good and a bad example. It's a good example of how you should write a requirement. Every one of your requirements reads out like a sentence like that. And this requirement says it has to be written in 6.0, probably because the original program was written in 6.0. The original program runs on a Windows 32 program, uh, operating system. Which is great, because you're building and adding three new features to it. <laughs> However, if you did this and your program isn't an upgrade, you probably don't want to spec this out like this. Because five years from now, are you really going to have 6.0? Well, you really don't have it now. <laughs> so, and this is less than five years old. I don't know how old this is. But anyway, long story short, there's a you have to kind of look at the gray area between do I put in too much or did I not put it in enough? So you want to avoid specifying technologies, avoid specifying version numbers of different things, unless you're doing an upgrade, and be as general as possible with, while being specific. <laughs> so you could say a Windows application must run on Microsoft Windows current version or something. Then, unless you know that it's not going to be compatible with a 64 bit, which would be the Current version, so. uh, the program shall contain a text. Here's a good uh, example here of the next two. Actually, I'll highlight both of these two aside here. You want to break it out one sentence at a time and outline it as much as possible and indent as much as possible and not make paragraphs. Uh, if you make paragraphs, the common mistake is to take, let's say, for example, these two bulleted. And I don't care if you use bullets or numbers, it doesn't really matter. You know, we don't actually have to do the traceability, which is good. If you were trying to enforce the traceability, you'd want to put the numbers. 
But see, the program shall contain a text-sensitive health facility. Period. Next item. <laughs> so the contact-sensitive help shall provide at the screen and menu levels. It is not necessary to provide contact-sensitive help at the data element input level. However, those two sentences kind of go together, I want to say, but they're different requirement than, let's say, the text help facility. So what you want to get out of that is that it's two different requirements, two different sets, not the same. Uh, I don't want to see a paragraph. Students love to mix in a bunch of requirements together into a paragraph. A paragraph's hard to read. So if you break it out line by line, you can actually use this as a checklist. Do we have the context sensitive help? Yes, we do. Do we have the context sensitive help with the input buttons? Oh, yes, we do. Do we have the context sensitive help with the input buttons and <laughs> the output data? Yes, we do. And we kind of go through the list. We don't have to repeat everything. So you can say content sensitive help. And then contact sensitive help shall provide a screen. Contact sensitive help shall provide an exit button. And it, it, basically what you're doing is reducing it down into sentences and then putting them on different categories. Does that make sense? Because that's one of the things that a lot of students kind of miss the boat on sometimes. When they put this together. It's natural to kind of like want to write more than one sentence together and actually put more than one requirement in the same sentence. What you want to do is kind of break out each one of the requirements into its own separate sentence uh, to, make, to be effective. However, you will see requirements documents out on the market that read like novels. <laughs> a paragraph, a paragraph, another paragraph, another paragraph. You can write a paragraph for your introduction, but for your requirements, the more you break it out, the easier it adds to the readability, actually. Makes it easier to read. So uh, here we don't have functional versus non-functional. We just have one that's called general under 3.0. So if you see now, we have 3.0 is general. 3. Point, excuse me, 3.0 or 3 was requirements. 3.1 is general. 3.2 is the user interface parameters. 3.3 is the user user interface refreshing directories. Notice we have sub-members, 3.1, 3.2, 3.3, and there are different categories, not broken out functional by a non-functional, functional, non-functional, non broken out by characteristics. You may or may not have a refreshing directories user interface. Don't use these headings. <laughs> I have actually seen it, and I've been shocked. And like, Wow, it's the same as the template. <laughs> How are they going to have directory refresh, refreshing directories in your user interface? You're not going to have it unless your program is this program. This is written for this program. So your task is to actually break it out into accounts payable, accounts receivable, if you're building an accounting program, thermostat buttons, thermostat sensors, thermostat in, you know, LCD control, thermostat this, thermostat that and things that are associated with thermostat control, or whatever it is that you're building. You'd think that would be a no-brainer, but I have seen it. Uh, here's another thing. If you want to put a placeholder in, it's perfectly fine to say TDD to be determined. The acronym of that stands for output report requirements. People do this when they're not quite done with it yet. Get to a certain point where you're like, I'm done with this, but I'm not done. Usually the night before it's due. I'm done with it, but I'm not done. <laughs> All right, later, later. Because sometimes you don't want to spec it out. And sometimes you don't want to, you want to leave it. Oh, we're not done with it yet, but we need to finish this document to move on to the next stage, but we haven't determined what exactly we want to do with this yet. If you don't have it, don't put it in. If you don't have any to be determined, leave it out. You don't have to have any to be determined in there. And then the rest of it kind of flows through the same, as I've mentioned before. Don't really be concerned with uh, what's going on in terms of the categories. You know, we have packaging requirements. Who packages anything anymore? And who, who? We, we can't even buy a CD ROM. Can you buy software and CD ROM anymore? I don't think. Well, yeah, I guess you can. You buy it on the internet. You have to pay to have the CD ROM sent to you, or you download for free. Or you download for the price and you have cost more to send CD ROM. That's totally outdated. Don't put packaging, unless you have packaging. You might not be creating a retail product 
you know, they're creating a product for a business. And you're just going to go over there and install it on their system. Here's the other thing that is interesting. This is an upgrade. It means the program exists. Which means we might actually have screenshots of an existing program. What people usually do, they take the screenshot, they draw a little circle, and a little arrow. Here's where the feature's going. <laughs> you don't need to do that <laughs> for your project unless you're doing an upgrade. You say, I'm going to take the EMS. You take a screenshot of the EMS and you're like, cross that out, cross that out, cross that out. We're going to draw a little box here and say, look, all it has is this one button that says register for classes. <laughs> That's all I want to use the system for. And then you can have screenshot offers, but you may or may not necessarily have any. Questions about the requirement specification document? That's the end of it, actually. Because, uh, so this one is uh, starts on 25, goes to 20, it's three pages long. It's, it's okay. It's about the level that you want to provide. But I'm not putting a minimum or a maximum page number on it. Questions on the first deliverable? So first we need to um, make a team that we have already done. Uh -huh. Second task is to write an email to you. Uh, Telling you who your team is. All and them. what you're going to build. And what are we going to make. And then put this together. And then I'll see you next time. <laughs> and we're going to analyze it next time. I mean, yeah. I mean, uh, apart from writing that email, do we need to upload this on the EMS or do we need no. to email this to you? Um, the, there'll be a spot. Here's how it works. We have some teams that will go week by week month by month, and we'll actually organize the work completely, and we'll have everything ready, and they'll work, you'll follow the waterfall model, and we'll look on requirements, to analysis, to design, and then we have some teams that will do all together simultaneously, and we're still working on the analysis, still working on the design. So I gave you the list of deliverables, and let's revisit that. Actually, now that I have lectured a little bit, you know what I'm talking about. Let's go back to the syllabus for a second. Let's go back and revisit what you got to actually do. Your grade in the course and the deliverables, this is what I've been talking about. Which is, as I mentioned, only 5% of your grade. Um, you're going to have in the EMS, depending upon how the TA, maybe the TA is listening right now, that's very good. Depending on how, the late way we did it last time is we had two options. You could go requirements, analysis, design prototype and upload them all differently because yeah and then we also last term last time I taught this about a year ago I guess we also had one on the bottom it said final project so students had a choice because some people like to do it all together and only upload it one time so there used to be at the bottom during the final week, once it's final project, we could take everything put into a zip file and upload it. It's the same as if you save it all up, submit it all at one time, or put it in different stages. It's all due by the end of the course. There's no due dates on each one of them. This gives you, believe it or not, flexibility. It's a good and a bad thing. And it actually gives you flexibility to kind of go through the waterfall model at your own pace. Because as I basically have reiterated over and over again, it's not a perfect model. <laughs> your team might do a slight variation to it. Might actually continuously work on the requirements while you're doing your analysis, while you're doing design. You might want to revisit. Do you really want to commit yourself to that requirements document, upload it, and then stop, and then work on the analysis, upload it, stop. Work on the design, upload, or do you want to wait, refine everything, and then at the end say we're done with everything? And then it's a lot of work to go back and upload everything individually. You can if you want, or you have the option of just zipping it all together, all four of your things requirements, your analysis, your design, your prototype, putting it all in one zip file, and upload. Here's my project. And because everyone in the team has got to do it for your own individual account, it's easier to take one file. You have choices. Um, the, unfortunately, the EMS has got like due dates and stuff on everything, but you can actually submit past the due date now. Um, you can actually delete your assignments. For these people who are familiar with this, you can actually delete now yeah. and resubmit it now, which is good. The flexibility was just added recently. But the way the course is structured is this is this is going to have the due date of the very last day of the course, 
and it's the project. And what will end up happening is when we get to our second class meeting, we're going to have, I'm going to be talking about the midterm exam, the CSLO, and I'll be talking about the analysis and the design. So this is pretty much the course itself and getting you up to speed is pretty much the objective of the first week. And the second one we're going to be talking about those three items. Analysis and those are pretty much the same thing. It's just two separate deliverables. And you can definitely feel free to read ahead on the analysis. And after our lunch break, I'm going to actually talk about the analysis and give you everything you need to know for the analysis document as well. But that's technically nothing that you have to worry about until the second, right after the second class meeting, last weekend, when I'll talk about the analysis, the design, and the prototyping and tell you what you need to do for the prototyping models, um, which is really easy. Don't stress out on the prototyping. And you'll also have the midterm that you'll have to do that will have a due date that will be in like a couple weeks or so after the second meeting. But we're like bang, bang, bang on those, on those weekends, <laughs> as you notice in the schedule. <coughs> so this seems like a short summer for some strange reason. I'm not quite sure why. Majority of the work is going to be in the middle of the course. A little bit in the beginning, a little bit at the end with the final exam, but a majority of it is going to be in the middle. We still have more for today. We're going to have a lunch break, though. Some of you are hungry, and I'm sort of hungry. So. Questions before we go to lunch? How long do you want for lunch? Half hour? 45? I got it kind of short because I always come back late. <laughs> so, what, see, it's a 12.53. It's 1 o'clock. 1.45? Is that good? Because some people don't go. They just hang around. All right, 1.45. We're going to start back up. I'm going to get, we're going to get through. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick up the pace a little bit. We're going to actually go till about 3, 3.30ish. Maybe four. It depends on how long-winded I am. Uh, and then we're going to cover a little bit more on analysis, so a little bit more on requirements, and go all the way through analysis up into design, which isn't too bad, actually. It's a very, very short lecture. Any other questions? 145. Okay.